Uh, Hilary, over to you. Okay. So, um, welcome, everybody. And it seems to be a big everybody that's growing every second. Um, so, just a very quick word or two about, about Socialist Register. I mean, this volume, which I, I really recommend everybody to get, I think Mike Calderbank, one of the people uh, doing a lot of work behind the scenes, is going to give details on the chat about how to get it. That's the website. And it's a really, really good volume, one of the best and very much in the tradition of Socialist Register, which is really to provide the intellectual tools that are enabling us to look ahead to both analyse what's happening, you know, the world as it is, as it were, the underlying trends, not just immediate events, but also the tools for thinking strategically about how to change it. And just for the younger people here, I mean, I see a lot of beards and white hair, but I, I know there are a lot of younger people too. Uh, uh, just to say that Socialist Register was founded in uh, 1964 by Ralph Miliband and, and John Saville, the social hist socialist historian, both of whom were activists as well as intellectuals. And in a way, Socialist Register has always been a, a tool for activists. Uh, I remember, I mean, it helped particularly the, the activists of 68 uh, who were, who were drawing, coming towards Marxism and wanted a Marxism that was that was a Marxism of debate and argument and new ideas, a creative Marxism. And that's what Socialist Register has been able to do. It's very much a, a journal of debate and analysis. Uh, and so I th a lot of people talk, are now talking about edu political education. And so I really recommend Socialist Register, along with other resources like the, the work of David Harvey for, as, a, as a tool. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just to say that Leo Panic, who was a, who's been a key um, bridge, I mean, this whole journal has carried on for over 50 years now, which is fantastic. Uh, and and Leo has been a key bridge from Ralph um, through to now. Um, and unfortunately, he's in hospital, but he's here. So hi, Leo. We're, we're all, you know, with you, as it were. Uh, he's in a very good public hospital in Canada and getting treatment. And I spoke to him last night and he's in... He's in good spirits and looking forward to, to today. So we owe him a huge, um, huge gratitude for both the register and for this volume, along with Greg, his co-editor, who I'll now hand over to. I'm going to be quite disciplined with the speakers so that there's time for you to uh, ask questions. You should put your questions in the chat and then Mike will um, identify them and then I'll ask, pose them at the end. Um, uh, so we can then go on to the rally uh, in defence of, of Jeremy. Over to Greg to, to introduce the volume uh, in six minutes, Greg. Thank you from uh, coming from Toronto. Uh, thanks to Hillary uh, for introducing and to Red Pepper and Tribune for helping organize this uh, volume, Beyond Digital Capitalism, uh, New Ways of Living. Uh, Leo and I have covered for each other over the years at uh, talks with students, classes, whatever. Uh, this is probably the most difficult uh, uh, time I've been asked to step in for him. Uh, he's had unexpected health problems. Uh, the diagnosis is, is very positive, uh, but there is a, a, a big struggle ahead for him. I think we all want to send our, our best wishes and best energies to Leo. Uh, and I he knows in turn that he's sending his best wishes for the launch here and, and to the coming rally for Jeremy. So uh, thanks, Leo, for and, and pull it all together, comrade. Uh, thanks. Um, after uh, two years looking back uh, over the century since the Russian Revolution, where we did a volume on rethinking revolution and another on rethinking democracy, we wanted to start looking closer at the at the period that uh, that we're in this context, uh, the long standing and discredited ideology of neoliberalism, uh, the, the incredibly distorted and dystopic forms of market allocations, uh, a world turned upside down uh, where there's almost nothing in the world order that we would endorse uh, the social polarizations that are occurring in multiple forms around the world and in each of our, our, our countries, uh, and the left still scrambling to find its, uh, to regroup and find its place again uh, as a contesting social force uh, for remaking the world in our own vision. Uh, 
we gathered our editorial uh, collectives in the in London and Toronto uh, a few years ago, and we began to map out a set of volumes together to address this context. Uh, a world turned upside down. Our our 2019 volume was uh, the beginning intervention in that direction. Last year we did a uh, the volume on Beyond Market Dysto Dystopia: New Ways of Living, the companion volume to this. Uh, one, uh, we're working now on volumes on uh, on polarization, uh, the new capitalism, uh, penetrating and overturning the neoliberal state. So we kind of have a, a big, huge agenda ahead of us uh, to keep kind of trying to uh, uh, uncover uh, the political dynamic and underlying uh, forces that are that are at work at this period. The remit uh, we gave ourselves uh, for this volume is stated well in the preface, and I just want to uh, 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 read from that preface for, for a, a, a few minutes to kind of set the context for uh, the contributors able to speak today. Um, so from the preface, uh, Beyond Digital Capitalism was planned long before the greatest health crisis by far in over a century exploded, quite literally on a global scale through the course of the first half of 2020. The crisis fully exposed for all to see the severe consequences of long-standing neoliberal state practices beholden to the blinkered competitive individualism of the proponents of pro-market ideology. And it drove them, however belatedly, confusedly, and temporarily to undertake the types of massive social expenditures they had denied only a month before. There was such a thing, Boris Johnson solemnly admonished the ghost of Margaret Thatcher in 10 Downing Street. But the pandemic also posed a new challenge for socialists, including for us as editors, as well as for the contributors to this volume who, who were invited, uh, who invited to analyze the nature of digital capitalism and its contradictions. Could we now do this in ways that also captured the significance of the pandemic and what it spoke to in terms of imagining, struggling for, and planning for new ways of living? In addressing how far digital ta technology has become integral to the capitalist market dystopia of the first decades of, of the 20th century, we were deliberately speaking to counter so much facile, futurist, cyper-utopian thinking that has proliferated through these decades. The proof of capitalism's continuing dy dynamism, even in the face of severe global economic crisis, lay in the most successful and cel most celebrated high-tech corporations of the new information sector. Which really, were, which really were restructuring and refashioning not only our ways of communicating, but of working and consuming, indeed, ways of living. Yet precisely because this was taking place within the logics of capitalist accumulation and exploitation, and through the reproduction of capitalist social relations, this produced new contradictions and irrationalities. It's not possible to kind of uh, review all the essays that we put together to uh, speak uh, to these contradictions and irrationalities, but to put a simple, uh, the simplest of matrices on the volume uh, and the assays that we've gathered, a set of essays examines automation and digital capitalism historically through changes in the modes of exploitation, work, and corporate organization. Uh, they reject, obviously, <laughs> clearly, uh, this, uh, the social and, and, and endorse the socialist posi position against techno deterministic determinist characterizations of the new, uh, of what Larry Lohman calls the new interpretation machines, uh, his characterization of uh, AI. A brace of essays looking at high tech capital, surveillance and social media possibilities uh, for alternative, uh, alternative control and platforms for communication. A series of essays examining alternative ways of living through the prism of the pandemic and alternative ways of social provisioning and participatory planning. Um, so it's great to have a range of the contributors here today who are all speaking to very, uh, various aspects of these three sets of essays. Uh, I think this volume uh, is, is really uh, a provocative intervention, not only into, th into thinking through what the pandemic is, but the way that the high tech uh, sector has kind of seized the moment uh, and the contradiction and ir irrationalities that have emerged in consequence of that. So I turn it over to the contributors to speak to their essays and I'm not getting admonished by Hillary for being too long, I hope. So thank you everybody. Uh, and our best wishes again to our comrade Leo for his recovery. Great, thanks Greg. And actually I hadn't quite worked out how to do my timer. So you were lucky. Um, anyway, uh, now over to you, 
so we're going to open up with two contributions, one of which is analysing the actual, you know, capital, which is Grace, who's an expert on capital, uh, and uh, looking at it from the left and from below, as it were, and then Ursula Hughes, which pro who pro provides a very visionary um, sort of strategic essay. So, Grace, I'll just introduce you very briefly. Firstly, um, Grace is on the staff of Tribune and is a brilliant uh, advert for Tribune, in a way, in, in her, the, the precision and, and rigour of her analysis. Uh, her latest book, which illustrates this particularly well, is The Corona Crash, which is already out. Isn't, isn't that right? It's out by Verso. So I'll hand over to, to Grace for her seven minutes. Thanks, Grace. Thanks so much, Hilary. It really is um, a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to try and keep this as short as conceivably possible so we can keep to time. Um, so the, the piece I've written for um, this year's SR starts from two key observations. Firstly, the kind of unprecedented level of uh, central bank interventions that have taken place over the course, particularly of the pandemic, but indeed over the context of the last 10 and actually kind of 30, 40 years. And also the dramatic increase in market concentration that has been particularly pronounced in the tech sector, but which has kind of also taken place across uh, the economies of the global north and particularly in the US um, over the last kind of well, in the period of the, the financial crisis. And now the specific mechanisms of this are described in my piece. Um, and I think there are a lot of interesting kind of points of, uh, um, of, of analysis uh, from the kind of, you know, more economic side of, of political economy that it's important to be aware of that I've brought up in that piece. Um, but I want to talk a little bit today uh, from a more theoretical perspective. Um, so the observation that, that kind of commences this piece is that the big four tech companies now make up, it was when I wrote it, 20% of the entire S&P 500. Now that's 25%. Um, that is a, a quite staggering level of market concentration um, that hasn't really been, been seen before in history. Now, part of this comes down to the nature of the particular crisis in which we find ourselves. Um, if you look at the kind of stock market boom, it's very one sided. It's driven almost entirely by tech on the one hand, whose business models are much better insulated from what's going on, but also things like clean energy and, and pharmaceuticals and health. Um, so, you know, in part that that uh, that concentration has been capital fleeing certain sections of the economy into others. But another part of it, and I think probably a more important part, is about state planning uh, in the context of a, a capitalist world system that is beset by increasingly problematic contradictions uh, that have become particularly obvious since, since the financial crisis. Um, and I think at this point it's useful to bring in, um, perhaps somewhat controversially given the origins of SR and the, the debate to which he gave his name, uh, some of Palantzas' ideas about the state um, as a kind of space or field within which class interests are organised and articulated, um, and within which some kind of struggle for, for hegemony takes place. And I think, you know, analysing the development of central banking through this lens is particularly interesting because obviously, you know, the kind of construction of the independent central bank in the 1990s marks a, a fairly significant turning point and really an attempt to kind of exclude uh, working class, but also other less kind of dominant capitalist interests in the determination of particular areas of, of very important areas of macroeconomic policy. Um, in Palantzas' conception, it was always emphasised that there were kind of how areas of the state were, to a greater or lesser extent, kind of permeable to different sets of interests, including those of the organised working class. But the central bank, in many ways, has become something that is much better insulated from those struggles. Um, it's, it's kind of very much only permeable to the interests of certain sections of capital um, and you know, international financial capital being the obvious and probably most powerful one, as well as certain sections of, uh, of the state and rooted in obviously where these different central banks take place. The European Central Bank is a, a different and very interesting example. I'm going to be focusing here on, on the Fed and, uh, and the Bank of England. Um, and I think that that kind of uh, that fact of the relative insulation of this field uh, of central banking from other areas of uh, well, basically from like uh, from um, uh, any broader sets of, of class interests um, can really allow us to get an insight into what a relatively pure form of capitalist planning might look like um, a form of planning which is directed by the interests of a particular section of capital. Um, at least when it comes to, to, uh, to the central bank. 
Um, and the, the problems that the central banks were attempting to kind of overcome. And I think, you know, it's important when we're thinking about the articulation of a, a particular class interest within the state. Often that comes down to the, 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 the context in which that takes place is a context in which, um, you know, an apparatus, generally an, an economic apparatus is assisting in um, uh, facilitating uh, uh, mechanisms to overcome a set of collective action problems that have been uh, that have been realised in often in the, in the wake of a particularly severe crisis of, of capital, and the crisis that we see emerging after the financial crisis, um, the kind of more secular long term crises, are associated with kind of falling productivity, lower levels of investment in fixed capital, um, a slowdown in globalisation. Uh, falling wages, uh, along with um, trends like automation and, and demographic aging, all of which are serving to kind of constrict outlets for profitable investment. Um, and, uh, you know, this is often referred to by um, by mainstream economists as a problem of secular stagnation. Um, uh, and either that's put down to a kind of slowdown in the rate of technological change um, or uh, a, a savings glut where there's too much savings basically and not enough investment outlets but obviously as uh, Mark says we would have a very different interpretation of that um, and I think post uh, global financial crisis we can see how this dynamic of capitalist planning as manifested in the central banking apparatus plays out so you you'll, you get extremely low interest rates uh, and quantitative easing in an attempt basically to kind of get the party going again uh, in the context of this really you know, long term structural problem, which is the kind of uh, lack of, of profitable investment opportunities. Um, and, you know, the way in which is, this is solved is no real solution at all, because it's just the, um, the cheapening of, uh, of finance. Um, in the sense of, you know, very, very low interest rates, so extremely loose monetary policy that we see in the wake of the financial crisis, um, and which actually dates back to um, the post um, tech bubble bursting. So the green, what was called the Greenspan put in the early 2000s, uh, is really an attempt to kind of organize a response to this very, very deep crisis. Um, and uh, you can see how, how that ultimately ends up working. Um, the mass of this kind of wall of money that is created by central banks enters into the international financial system uh, in the context of, you know, the absence of these uh, profitable investment outlets. And you see the result, which is an inevitable fourth round of asset price inflation as investors reorganize their portfolios away from government bonds with yields falling um, and, you know, put money into things like equities, which is why you see this massive uh, bull run in US stock markets, also into things like housing um, and also into lending to uh, not particularly credit worthy corporations. So you see a, a big spike in demand for high yield corporate debt, which is basically debt from corporations that are seen as particularly risky. And this increased the apparent returns on investment in a lot of markets in a lot of different parts of the world. And that's indeed been part of what um, has you know, not facilitated a recovery, really, because, I mean, if you look at the growing gap between stock markets and anyway, what this has done, whilst kind of solving one problem, it's, it's created a whole host of others uh, in the sense that a lot of this cheap capital was, as I describe in the piece, used to take on. Uh, and facilitate another round of mergers and acquisitions activity, um, which uh, has given us the kind of market structure that we see today and created a very, very centralized form of capitalism, as Marx would have called it. I think there's now some recognition on the part of the kind of most enlightened er elements of capital that the current system is being governed by a kind of short termist elite that's working against the kind of long term interests of capitalism, that you can see the kind of attempts by central banks to reorient um, asset purchases towards climate goals um, and things like Andy Haldane going around the UK, touring different parts of the country and, and doing outreach as a reflection of this problem. Um, and yeah, I mean, it comes down to the fact, and I will end here, that uh, the threat is one of an economic apparatus that is increasingly divorced from wider structural changes in society and which therefore becomes fairly brittle and loose in its capacity to act in the interest in the long-term interests of capital as a whole. Um, and what this means is that we're really entering into a new phase of, of, of crisis and of contradiction, which is marked by this problem of the kind of growing gap between uh, asset values in the real economy covered over by a huge amount of debt alongside this massive problem of, of growing market concentration uh, that has kind of preoccupied a lot of mainstream economists in recent years. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I will stop there. Great, so I really recommend her, her essay, her chapter, and also her column in Tribune. Uh, so now over to Ursula, and just without taking any of your minutes, Ursula, I just want to tell people that 
she's, she's been working on the whole issue of digital capitalism for, for decades. Her first seminal essay in 1999 uh, in Socialist Register was called The Material World or Material World, The Myth of the Weightless Economy. And then in 2001, she wrote a very important paper called The Making of a Cybertariat. Uh, and so uh, Ursula is quite a sort of um, expert in this, and as well as been thinking very practically in response to the um, the COVID crisis and the, the, the new kinds of thinking that's, that's stimulated. So Ursula, over to you. Uh, for well, your... Thanks very much, Hilary. Hello, everybody, and a special hello to Leo. You know, we're all with you. Take care. Um, I thanks thanks to for to to Grace for her very good introduction, which which helps me speed up a little bit. Um, because the first point I want to make is that this pandemic arrived in an e economic situation which was highly dynamic. Since the financial crisis, there has been this enormous restructuring of capital, which, which Grace talked about so eloquently, um, involving, uh, crucially, new forms of commodification, including commodification of public services, and, um, and, and, and a, use, uh, a whole series of new uses of, of technology, uh, you know, including for the control of labour. But th this crisis was also, I think this is point is not so often well understood. It was a crisis for the working class, a crisis of social reproduction. Working people who could no longer get the credit that was kind of chucked at them before the crisis, um, suffering the effects of austerity and with declining real wages, actually experienced a, a, a massive shortening of the working day and need to work much, much longer hours and to take on extra work on top of the work they did, which produced a huge crisis of social reproduction, which I actually read about in the last issue of Socialist Register. And that these things taken together produced an enormous restructuring of the workforce. So in some research I did between just between 2016 and 2019, the three years before the pandemic, there was a more than doubling of the proportion of the workforce working for online platforms and the proportion of workers more generally who are managed by algorithms. So the crisis arrived, if you like, like, like landing on a moving vehicle. It arrived in an already very, very high, highly dynamic situation. And um, it, it, in its landing, some of the pre-existing trends were very much accelerated. Some you know, came screeching to a halt, as we all know, the, the airline industry, um, high street retail. And, you know, there are some, some sectors of capital have been very badly hit, but it's been an absolute bonanza of others, including IT companies and delivery companies. Um, the, 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 the concentration of capital that Grace was talking about has greatly increased the um, the proportion of the workforce working directly or indirectly for global corporations has greatly increased globally. And there has been um, an acceleration of various trends in the workforce that have led, at least in the short term, to a very dramatic polarization. On the one hand, we have the workers who provide the essential services, public services like health and education, and essential uh, work in essential industries like food processing, and more importantly, delivering all the goods and services to everybody else in the pandemic, who are disproportionately uh, from black and minority ethnic backgrounds, disproportionately poorly paid, disproportionately precariously employed. And then on the other hand, we have the workers who are locked down in their homes, teleworking, who are um, more likely to be white, more likely to be in salaried jobs. But, um, and this kind of polarization, um, it could seem as if it's creating 
um, a situation where some groups of workers have completely different interests for, for others. But actually, there are some common strands that unite these groups in ways they've never been united before. One of which is the fact that both groups are much more likely to be working for global corporations than they were before. And both groups are subjected to new forms of digital management and surveillance using, uh, whether it's using your webcam to watch what you're doing during the day at home or, or using GPS to track your every move in your delivery vehicle or, or whatever it is. And so it's actually created a kind of a new, if you like, agenda for workers of how to function in these new conditions of heavy digital management. Now, I'm, I'm going to cut to the chase. I know Hillary will shut me up if I don't. <laughs> so I'm going to not make a lot of other points. I have in my new book here, <laughs> I do talk about some of the strategies um, for, for, for workers in these new digital conditions, the new kinds of uh, universal rights that workers need, I would argue, in, in these new conditions. But, but I, I, I also want to talk about what's the good news? What's the good news for socialists in these developments in the pandemic? And I think the first bit of good news is that at last, at last, this myth of there is no alternative has been exploded. The neoliberal myth that has hung over most, most people um, under the uh, under the age of 45 have never lived in a world in which people have believed in, in, in an alternative to the market and and, um, and, and, and and in new roles for the state and uh, and a sort of a, 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 a folding back so to speak of, of, of 20th century ideas of what what a public welfare might look like so I think that's very good news because I don't think I don't think we'll be conned again. I hope not. I, th I think there really is a new sense of of of, of the emptiness uh, and, and and the 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 manifest implausibility of this neoliberal idea that everything can be left to markets. And I think that's a bit of good news. And I think the other bit of good news is the way in which the use of new technologies by workers. But, or members of the working class, I should say more broadly, um, has, has reached a kind of maturity now. I think throughout the history of capitalism, every time a new technology has been used, you know, because it's been helpful for speeding up production or making workers more productive or so on, and has been a new set of universal skills has been required of workers, um, that for all its biases, its many biases, uh, it, it, it has given workers new tools to use um, to organise and to resist. You know, you can think of the telephone in the 20th century. You can think even earlier than that. You think of the way numeracy and literacy created um, generations of workers who for the first time were able to demand things like universal suffrage and to campaign for them. And I think in just that way, the use of smartphones and social media and so on is now equipping workers with new ways of organising. We've seen a lot of this in the pandemic, new ways of gathering evidence and, um, and, and new ways of communication. And I'll shut up, Hilary. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but, but, do you wind up? You've got a, you've got half a minute to wind up. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. You can have your half a minute. <laughs> Just uh, read out the title of your book again, because I, I. Oh, it's called "Reinventing the Welfare State: Digital Platforms and Public Policies." And the main, uh, the, the, the main argument, if you like, is that just as in the, in the mid-20th century, one of the demands that was made with the new welfare state was a, a decommodification of the technological infrastructure, nationalisation of electricity, for instance, nationalisation of telephones. And what we need to do now is to do a similar decommodification of digital platforms. John McDonald started the ball rolling with, with the idea of public broadband in the last Labour Party manifesto. And I think we can build on that by, in a bottom-up way, in local communities, developing alternative uses for these digital technologies for the public good. Great, Ursula. Well, that's a wonderful intro into John. <laughs> Thanks very, very much. It was brilliant, as usual. And her essay is similarly so. So I really recommend it. 
Um, so the next speakers are two, but this doesn't mean you have double the time. You've got to divide it between you. So this is Charles Omni and Matt Cole from Leeds. And actually, in a way, their essay follows very well from what Ursula's just said, because she talked a lot about the control, the new forms of control over labour. And that's exactly what their essay and hopefully their contribution now uh, is called. Um, it is about, I mean, they've called it um, the datification of labour, uh, a new digital, um, a new political economy of datification and work, a new digital tailorism, they ask. So I'm not sure how you're going to do it. Is it Charles uh, for yeah. two minutes and then Matthew for three? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk for two minutes and then Matt can speak the rest of the time. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, hi, everyone. I, I'll start by very, very swiftly sending best wishes to Leo, of course, as well. Um, so our contribution to Socialist Register is about the political economy of datification and work. Um, in other words, we're talking about how the advance of digital technologies and artificial intelligence affects the power dynamics between workers and capital. But of course, maybe more importantly, okay. vice versa, how the dynamics of the relationship between workers and capital, how these class dynamics affect the trajectory of technological change because we know that it's not just no, no, wait this is fine just one second that um uh, technology comes in and reshapes social structures such as in class relationships but social structures affect the way technology is designed implemented and used in practice particularly at work so when discussing these questions we're not just interested in kind of high level quantitative labor market changes such as automation and job replacement we're also interested in the quality of work in other words, what is the day-to-day -day reality of working life actually like for people? This question kind of really matters on quite a profound level. The things that happen to people on a daily basis at work and the grievances they may have there. For instance, does their job, does their boss use um, digital methods to keep tabs on them? How does autom automation change the pace of their job? What kind of skills they're able to use? What level of, of autonomy they have? These things are really important to people on quite a personal level. The sad thing is these questions have largely been depoliticized. Um, so if 20 million people hate their jobs, then that would generally nowadays be perceived as kind of 20 million little individual problems rather than one big one. But when we start to understand these kind of things collectively, then we can start unraveling the role of digitalization and how it's vital for understanding kind of new frontiers of class conflict and class politics and the sort of wider, as Ursula was saying, the wider potential constituency for that kind of politics. So at Leeds, for instance, we're charting the development of a kind of developing global wave of labor unrest in the platform economy, um, which spans pretty much every single corner of the world. Um, please do get in touch with me if you wanna know any more about that. Um, so quality of work matters in the context of digitalization. And I'm now gonna hand over to Matt to talk a bit more about the specifics of RSA. Thanks, Charles. Um, so it's hard to compress uh, the essay into this amount of time. We a lot of it was also uh, written by our colleague Hugo Radice, who I think is in the call as well. But um, having three people talk about it, I think, was a bit too much. Um, so I think the the overall thrust of the essay was to look at. Um, contemporary technology within a broader sort of historical and a kind of qualitative materialist uh, through that sort of lens. Uh, because much of the debate around the transformation, uh, uh, whether it's called second machine age, fourth industrial revolution, industry 4.0, rise of the robots, or the sort of fifth chondrative wave, uh, like the Paul Mason refers to, a lot of it's been concentrated on the question of labor displacement and fear of a jobs apocalypse. Um, but a lot of the debate around this engages at a level of abstraction that tells us very little about some of the more qualitative changes in working life and also like doesn't look at the technology in enough detail. Um, another problem is that a lot of the sort of mainstream uh, approach approaches, uh, approach, the, uh, sorry, it's based on the assumption that technologies are autonomous actors driven by their own inner logic rather than socially shaped or embedded in our political, economic, and cultural institutions. So against this, we sort of 
hold that uh, technology is not neutral, which is um, an argument that's made by a lot of Marxists. Um, but at the same time, try to walk a fine line between that and, and recognizing there's that a failure to examine the particular aspects of the different technological innovations, their dissemination throughout industry, and their sort of different social impacts, risks, uh, either overstating or sometimes understating their role in, in transformation. Um, so the essay begins with an analysis of a, a fairly brief analysis, um, to be honest, of, of data in AI-driven platforms, which have allowed for mass commodification of data and the formal subsumption of informal work, like a lot of gig economy was cash in hand informal work, not in formal employment, but also then the sort of real subsumption, which entails a technological transformation of an existing labor process. Um, so the real subsumption of uh, auditing managerial intellectual types of labor processes. Um, it, also, it also puts forward the idea that um, is actually is being talked about in, in the EU at a policy level that workers and consumer data is now contributing without re remuneration to the stock of intangible capital that at some point will could replace their their labor. Um, okay, I have two minutes, but okay. I'll try to push through. Um, so. The point is that these technologies have exponentially amplified some longer trends towards increasing inequality, concentration of wealth, and precari precarization of labor as a method of class discipline and um, sort of despotic control. And uh, I think Alex Wood is in the audience as well, who's re recently written a book on sort of uh, the sort of despotism of these kind of platform algorithm, algorithmic management. Um, so just to uh, summarize a little bit, uh, the essay, the middle of the essay shows how subsumption to different logics of capital is a sort of involving historical process with multiple waves of formal and real subsumption linked to technological change, but also really importantly, markets, finance, the state, and different sort of geopolitical orders. Um, at the end, it also sets out some concrete proposals uh, based on an understanding of the technology towards a more platform enabled socialism. I think really concrete proposals is something uh, that is important. And maybe uh, like a decade ago, the left was kind of lacking though in recent times, we've actually become a lot better at this. So there, we put forward three, one for socialist AI, one for socializing, digital infrastructures uh, through you know, democratic nationalization. Um, uh, there, there's a great report that came out that the Labour Party put out around like new, new ways of ownership that sort of inspired me in this regard. And then a little bit about post scare, moving towards a sort of post scarcity economy with work time reduction. Um, I also want to say that um, I've recently moved from Leeds to Oxford to work on this project uh, called the Fair Work Project that's also trying to develop like global uh, standards for labor similar to the ILO um, and yeah I think we need to think at a global and planetary level as internationalists and uh, as we have a deepened understanding of digital capitalism. Thanks. Great Matt, thanks. You finished before the bell. Uh, great, that's really good. And thanks, Hugo Radici, as well. And, and I know this is a really good essay. And, and I'm so glad that you're ending on those practical proposals, because I think, you know, that's the tradition of Socialist Register to provide the analysis, but not distinct from practical politics, but actually feeding into and strengthening that practical politics. So we'll come back to that with, um, well, with John. But before that, um, Ben Selwyn will be talking very practically about the decommodification of food. Um, so I can't see him, but he must be somewhere there. Um, he's from Sheffield um, and he's written a very um, sort of concrete utopia, sort of feasible utopia essay on um, community restaurants, which actually did exist um, during the war. And interestingly, a less um, publicized part of Labour's manifesto included the national food strategy, which included um, community restaurants. 
So Ben, what, um, far away. There you are. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Uh, thanks for you've got five minutes. I'm going to have to be brutal. Timing myself a little. I've, I've, I've got my got my clock there. I'm timing myself. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah. Uh, greetings to everyone and uh, best wishes to Leo. I hope you get better as soon as possible. Um, you know. So Ursula said, "Where's the good news?" So just to be provocative, Rishi Sunak. Here's the good news, um, not because of anything uh, he says but uh, or, or represents, but because uh, during the pandemic, he implemented this uh, Eat Out to Help Out uh, scheme, which uh, subsidised, uh, you know, us going out to restaurants. And uh, obviously, being, the, being a Tory and being part of the Tory plan, it led to a spike in COVID and it didn't work. But the core argument is that uh, what he did was to show that uh, public subsidies of food and things that we are usually market dependent upon is totally feasible. And actually, you just all you have to do is uh, go back a little bit more and you see there's huge public subsidies for food in the common agricultural policy uh, and things like that. So, you know, this this idea that uh, you know, the free market works is, is has been exploded to a large extent and that opens up the space for a concrete critique. Uh, so when we look at the food system, you know, we have the uh, worldwide uh, 800 million people hungry, 2 billion people overweight, uh, whilst you also have uh, abundance of food being produced, you know, more than enough to being produced. In the, in the United Kingdom, the, the uh, original kind of emergence of capitalist agriculture by mid-2020, you had 5 million people uh, food insecure, uh, mostly affected were black asian minority ethnic people um you have a whole range of kind of food insecurities and food inequalities within the united kingdom uh you know land is heavily concentrated in the hands of uh, speculative capital finance capital to a large extent uh, labor and paying conditions on uh, farms are, is worse than elsewhere in the economy uh you know the gender gap uh the gendering of food production you know in the kind of unpaid uh, realm of uh, care work, social reproduction is heavily gendered, and it went up massively during the uh, COVID period. I mean, uh, in the in an article, I give one example. Something I think something about like four million. Uh, it went from like nine to thirteen to fourteen million uh, women doing unpaid work, uh, caring for relatives, um, and so on. And then when you look at food delivery, look at the delivery Uber Eats and things like that, you see uh, you know kind of piece rate production hustling for work. <clears throat> a, a new form of kind of despotism. But of course, uh, you know, what this also shows, as Ursula and others have shown, is, you know, the technology exists, the subsidies exist, the know-how exists to uh, generate something very different. And, uh, you know, most, uh, common, you know, and lots of people know that, you know, talk about food, everyone's interested, uh, probably because most people feel unhealthy, uh, but also they are, they realise that something's wrong with the food system. But unfortunately, the, the common, the kind of main alternative to food is like change your diet, you know, eat uh, plant instead of eat the regular burger and stuff like that, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, it misses out the kind of class relations, uh, class dynamics of alternative food systems and so on. And so that's why I wrote this piece uh, about community restaurants as a form of decommodification of the most basic wage good in many ways. Um, and decommodification can be seen as kind of a way of existing uh, increasingly free of market dynamics, so free of market dependence. Uh, and the welfare state was a, a slight form of decommodification. Uh, but decommodification by itself is not enough. You also have to have democratization and the shift in power from capital to labor, uh, labor encroaching on the power of capital to a larger extent. And so the community restaurant idea, now it's true, is uh, taken up by labor in the uh, manifesto. It's existed previously. Uh, and I mean, there's evidence to say it would cost, you know, you could have a quite nice community restaurant system, uh, it costs around 20 billion a year. Uh, but, you know, if you tax uh, wealth as much as you tax income, you could probably raise around 150 extra billion pounds a year in this country alone. So, you know, the, the money exists there and it's a demand that could exist. And when you think about it, you know, the you can have uh, electronic demand, uh, electronic ordering of food, you can have uh, these community restaurants could be funded publicly. They could be run democratically. There could be a kind of democratic, uh, it could be kind of regenerate the uh, communities. And this is one thing that the left has to realise. A lot of the right gets its strength from the idea of, oh, that we, we stand up for the community. And um, actually community restaurants, decommodifying food could be a real regenerative hub for uh, class-based politics uh, from below. Um, 
And, you know, it could be tied into things like the restructuring of agriculture from land reform, community farms, uh, subsidies to alternative forms of food. So I realise we've gone up to five minutes in blink of an eye for me. Uh, so I'll stop there and say thanks very much. Hope that made sense. Thanks. Yes, no, no, that was brilliant. And I, was, again, you've beaten the bell. Uh, so that was really good and very inspiring. And I think it's something that we could already be beginning to do in a way. Out of the crisis, we could be organising with whatever resources we can get at some kind of beginnings of a, of a of a community restaurant system. Anyway, this is for discussion. And certainly, I know it, all the time, John's contribution is being prefigured by people mentioning what was in the manifesto and what needs to be built on. So thanks a lot, Ben, for a really inspiring essay and an and inspiring contribution. So another part of the um, this very rich volume addresses the the kind of um one of the contradictions which Ursula hints at which is the way in which the the tools of the new technology um are being you know are, are tools that we can use as it were communicating within and against digital capitalism and there's a brilliant essay on this by Tana Merlees and then linked to that are different examples of um socialist expression or working class expression in the age of digital capitalism. And one of these essays is by Mo um, Molina, who's here, um, and who's a lecturer at um, in the anthropology department at Goldsmiths. And he's going to be talking about working class cinema in the age of digital capitalism. And he's going to, I think, make one or two remarks, particularly about um, Ken Loach's work. Um, but anyway, Mao, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Hilary. And um, uh, again, my good wishes to Leo. Um, so my chapter uh, discussed the relationship between working class uh, cinema and labor politics uh, in the UK, but also uh, globally. And then I am an anthropologist of labor and class, but my interest in cinema uh, uh, started in 1999, when I, uh, at the end of a long sociological research in Sheffield, where I was looking at the uh, decline uh, of the working class in the context of the industrialization, urban gentrification, and the transition of the city from uh, being a steel industry based to into uh, becoming a cultural city. And uh, living in Sheffield in the 1990s, the disruption of the steel industry seemed to go hand in hand with the construction of uh, new cinemas, new arts galleries. And uh, when I was uh, there in, in Sheffield, Ken Lodge was actually there recruiting for his latest film at the time, The Navigators, which tells the struggle of uh, uh, railway workers against the privatization of the, the railway in 1995. And the film was, uh, uh, came out uh, when I was there, and the message that uh, the film gave to the local working class was that the struggle against capital and against the privatization had been already lost. And that was at the time when my friends, uh, Steve Walker and other, other uh, 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 people in the labor movement were still struggling uh, against privatization. So in the uh, chapter, I also discussed the long tradition of militant cinema in the UK, from John Grierson to free cinema, cinema action, the independent film uh, movement in the 1980s, uh, the film Night Cleaner of the Berkeley Street Collective, and um, paradoxically, in the 80s, it was the privatization of the television and the emergence of Channel 4 that gave uh, voices to uh, new subjectivity from the black and women filmmakers from minority uh, background. And that was the time also of the rise of multiculturalism and uh, the uh, uh, diasporic uh, theory uh, associated with Stuart Hall. But it was under new labor that working class cinema was turned into some kind of brandy, brandified version uh, of uh, militant cinema in which the British working class was uh, presented as a cultural subject rather than a political formation. This was not the militant multiculturalism of Stuart Hall, but this was uh, the uh, cool Britannia, the Britpop, the YBAs of Tony Blair um, um, associated with this uh, third wave. And the only voice that in the 1990s was really uh, continuing to talk about uh, working class politics was Ken Lodge. But here uh, I uh, address a, a brief and short criticism to his uh, cinema through the analysis of the last film that is, uh, sorry, we missed you. 
And the film tells the story of uh, uh, Ricky, a uh, delivery worker, and Abby, his wife, uh, a contract nurse and in home carers against the uh, a human process of capitalism. So we have all the characteristic of a, a gig economy and the struggle of the workers against the gig economy. So we have uh, the uh, harsh delivery standards, the uh, fees instead of the wages. We have the labor franchise instead of the contract of employment and the 24-hour uh, uh, availability. So Loach uh, adopted a realist style. Uh, he uses non-professional actors, working class location, and the script uh, very often by Paul Leverty, who actually, uh, is, which uh, write, who writes uh, scripts that are based on real life ethnographic observation. So all these kind of realistic uh, component draw uh, the spectator into a kind of detached and, and alienated in sense of Lukacs uh, spectatorial observation of working class life, which is also enhanced by the soft light and the great cinematography uh, of Ken Loach. And the other thing is the film, Ken Loach film, and constructed as melodrama. And uh, uh, here I'm going back to Laura Malvey, theory of melodrama. Uh, which is basically a, a, a staging, a tragic and epic staging of the conflict between the working class and the mighty forces of capitalism. And the struggle that we know uh, straight away, the beginning of the film that is lost when the worker signed the contract. Historically, the, melodrama, the, the genre of melodrama was used by cinema to deconstruct middle-class morality. And Laura Malvey talks about the film of Douglas Sirk in the depiction of the catastrophic consequences of the patriarchy and racism of the affluent bourgeoisie. But Ken Loach turns the melodrama against the very working class, and this obviously uh, leaves uh, the working class subject very uh, 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 disempowered. So I guess in the conclusion, uh, I uh, argue that in the era of digital capitalism, uh, left-wing politics uh, and the fight against capital doesn't happen only on social media, but the left must develop uh, new forms of working class cinema that function not just in terms of class representation, but more fundamentally for political organizing, ranging from campaigning, research and consciousness raising. Thank you. Okay, Mo. Well, there's lots to discuss there. Um, so um, now we're going on to two contributors who haven't produced essay, uh, essays for this volume, but whose thinking and work on this area, this whole issue of digital capitalism uh, and, as it were, how to transcend it in and against it, as it were, um, is very, uh, very useful. So firstly, Marzina Zukowski, who's a Polish organiser and co-coordinator um, of the Radical Communication Network, and she's on the board of Red Pepper and has played a very important role in in the sort of renewal of Red Pepper, which you can subscribe to. There'll be details in the um, in the chat about Red Pepper coming from Charlotte Austin. Great, thank you so much, Hilary, uh, for the warm introduction. Um, I would just like to start by emphasizing my gratitude to Leo, Greg, and all of the contributors of Beyond Digital Capitalism. I mean, when I started reading it, I very much immediately saw it as a kind of handbook, um, really the breadth of practical knowledge, the historical context and the big ideas are ones that we can come back to time and time again. Um, I should say that I come to this discussion uh, very much as a labor and immigrant rights organizer, and then also as a communication strategist, as Hillary mentioned. I've had the opportunity to work across many different um, cross-border, multilingual and international contexts from the feminist resistance in Poland and across the diaspora to working with domestic workers in the US to migrant rights in the UK. And there's so much that we could unpack in this rich discussion. So I'll just focus on weaving together uh, a few key, if not disparate themes that emerged um, for me as critical from a social movement organizing standpoint. Um, so first, uh, I think it's critical to meet our communities where they're at, whether that's on Facebook or another platform. As Ursula Hughes uh, has revealed in her essay, but also in this discussion, the kind of large scale in person mobilizations that we've had in recent years couldn't have been possible without electronic technology and social media. Yet really tech is just a means to an end, right? It's about the acumen of the social justice organizers 
with longstanding community ties who have really, I'd say, co-opted and remixed the tools that were built for corporate gain. Um, Tani, uh, Tanner Mitley's uh, writes in her Beyond uh, Digital Capitalism chapter, uh, smartphones did not make the new protest movement, social media platforms did not build uprisings. Um, similarly, you know, Black Lives Matter was never about a hashtag. Co-founder Alicia Garza fought for reproductive rights and racial justice in Southern California since her teens. Um, similarly, uh, hashtag Me Too would have never taken off without the networks that Tarana Burke had built for over a decade and a half. And then in Poland, as in the US, feminist organizers were able to mobilize the largest demonstration since 1989 because of deep community relationships. Facebook became a way to not only make the personal political around abortion rights, but to reach small rural towns that have long been a stronghold of the very much authoritarian Law and Justice Party. But rather than dictating hierarchical strategies, the Polish women's strike invests in young working class women and queer and, and non-binary activists and gives them the support and training to organize locally. But the online to offline is really key here because today using Facebook, Polish feminists can get 200 small towns, big cities and diasporic communities directly into the streets in a matter of days. In the time of COVID-19, this has looked like car blockades, uh, socially distanced protest queues near grocery stores, and, and nearly 2,000 people in front of London's Polish embassy just a month ago. Um, still, we must recognize that the social media tools that we use to foment uh, progressive social change are run by big tech companies who surveil activists and profit in crises, just as Grace uh, Blakely has documented. Uh, we must find ways to build revolutionary alternatives while, of course, using all of the tools at our disposal to organize resistance. And then a second key point I wanted to make is that I think we need to be looking at historical examples for insight into organizing in the rising gig economy. Um, forgive me for, for making a lot of references in this section to, um, to the United States, but as Matthew Cole and Charles Umi make clear, gig platforms should not be reified as somehow unique or, or determinant drivers of a new labor regime. Because um, despite the, the kind of isolation platforms like Uber and Deliveroo form, uh, gig economy and digitally outsourced work has actually been a site of aggregated creative resistance and protest. In fact, many of these organizers are using very similar tactics to ones that have been used historically by other precarious sectors, including domestic work and care work. Um, these are both sectors that are mostly driven by immigrant women and women of color. Uh, often excluded from traditional union and labor organizing, these quote unquote disaggregated domestic workers who labor in private homes, often in isolation, have been innovative by necessity. In the 1880s, on the heels of the second industrial revolution, we had the black washerwomen in Atlanta, Georgia, who successfully staged a month long strike for increased wages and autonomy, obviously much, much pre-social media. And then in the 1910s, we had migrant domestic workers from Mexico, led by Carmelita Torres, who staged a protest against forced delousing at a border checkpoint in El Paso, Texas, one that they crossed every single day. And then scholar Sadia Hartman, just to give one more example, documents incredible radical solidarity and networks of care that formed in 1920s Harlem between sex workers and domestic workers who were waiting on, on the same street corners for work every day. And today, to kind of bring it back to the present, delivery drivers are building connections while waiting for meal pickups. Task rabbit workers are forming online solidarity networks to fight back against racist, gendered, and biased customer ratings. And live-in cares, and, and we've seen this in our work here in the UK, are using Facebook groups to share tips about immigrant rights during the Brexit transition. So I think this hyper-connectivity means that we can share so many tactics across sectors, but also internationally. What works in the UK or the US um, could also be replicated in other places like Poland, France, Australia, um, Argentina. And my last point um, is that digital media storytelling, which was another kind of, and, and, and Mao talked about this a little bit, but a, another big section of um, beyond digital capitalism is that digital media can really be a site um, of expanding our radical imagination and the boundaries of what is possible. Um, as Mao 
Oh, uh, Malona writes, um, working class representation can and should be a space for political struggle, especially when driven by working class creators. Today, this representation traverses so many different mediums that we're working with, from a five second meme on TikTok and Michaela Cole's Channel 4 series Chewing Gum, all the way to a Corbin themed video game or Siobhan McGurk's uh, viral article in Red Pepper about COVID-19 and busy parks. Art, pop culture, and storytelling on a whole should be seen as visionary tools uh, that complement our organizing. At the Radical Communicators Network, for example, we understand storytelling in the context of narrative power. The idea that stories and how they're told and framed defines whose lives and voices matter and whose do not. Um, storytelling on digital platforms has created a space to deconstruct dominant narratives while amplifying a multitude of voices and lived experience. Um, and, and this by extension, broadens on our own boundaries of, um, of what's possible. For example, we can take an idea like radically decommodifying food as Benjamin Selwyn proposed um, and make it feel tangible and possible. My last point, Hillary, I promise. Um, I just wanna emphasize that we must uh, really recognize the work of socialist communicators as, as vital, but also remember that it's right now completely underfunded and it's at the mercy of philanthropic institutions, ones whose interests um, change with the trends. And, and at Red Pepper, um, kind of at, at, the, at the height of COVID-19, um, you know, as a print magazine, we struggled to figure out how to, how to ramp up this digital infrastructure. So, you know, I kind of want to close with saying, that maybe this is a, a nudge towards, um, towards funders that, you know, maybe instead of looking for the next big tech innovation to find, let's let's look for ways to support existing socialist outlets and initiatives um, and organizing that that is um, kind of building the resistance we're um, we're looking ahead to. Great, uh, Marina, and, and that final point is really important, and I think that's one reason why this event is is a good development because I think the way that um, we can advance in terms of the alternative media is by creating a sort of communications infrastructure. So the way that we have done uh, with Tribune and with Socialist Register this time. So I hope that this initiative will be the beginnings of many where we the different alternative media come together to, to reach out to a wider audience. The next person, it needs no introduction. I know you formally say that he's the shadow chancellor of the executive, or used to be, um, and nearly was the actual chancellor. But I, in a way, I feel that's a bit mechanical. I think um, a bit traditional and conventional compared to John, who is not conventional and traditional, uh, and who has been at the forefront of thinking on this. So that he, working with um, his colleague Richard Barbrook, developed a digital manifesto. They developed the, the idea of um, a public broadband, which is now talked about as being, you know, absolutely what's necessary. Um, many people have talked about the the kind of policies that are needed now, which are all policies that John was working on, you know, from 2016. So I know you always move on, John. So hopefully um, this event will have made you move even further. <laughs> okay. So Thanks. Thanks, Hilary. Thanks ever so much. I'll be brief as possible so we can get into the questions. Again, just to say, Leo, get well soon. Look, we wish you a swift recovery. Anything that you need, let us know, even if it's just so you can phone, up, phone us up and we can have a rant together about the failures of social democracy. Just do so. It might be therapeutic for you. Anyway, swift recovery. Can I throw this idea in, Greg, Leo, and others as well? That actually, this event is terrific. I, I think it's great, but it's exactly the point that Ursula made now. We've got tools that we can use, like online events like this. Each one of the chapters could be done on an event like this, and I think people would be interested in taking each chapter to discuss and to develop and then pile on other, other, I suppose, contacts in different fields that we've got, because part of our problem is that actually the specialisms don't get brought together sufficiently. So I just threw that in as an idea and you'll most probably say you're creating a bed of nails for us, but I'm really sorry, but right, if you could do. Um, I also, I wanna just refer to Greg's um, uh, paper. It's the, it's the final paper in, in the book itself. 
because actually it strikes at the heart of what socialist register is all about and always has been. The point of socialist register for me is exactly as Hillary said, it brings, um, an, it brings together a wide range of people who will set the scene of what's happening within our economy and political system from which then we can use that information to plan and develop the individual struggles. And the point of Greg's paper, I think, strikes at the heart of this recent discussion in recent years around the digitalization of our economy, et cetera, and the, the use of the expression artificial intelligence, which we should reject. It's a, this techno-eco-determinism and that's developed in a number of fields that somehow the development of technology will lead us all, almost automatically without struggle to a post-capitalist existence. Uh, what Greg's paper does is take each one of the advocates of a whole range of theories and positions, whether it's um, Stiglitz in terms of you know, uh, the sort of uh, Keynesianism re revamped, or whether it goes through then in the different aspects of the full automation arguments from Paul, Mason's and, Paul Mason and others, and Hart and Negri about the development of the commoning, et cetera. And actually it brings us back, it just brings us back and said, you, you, cannot, you cannot move towards um, a new society uh, without the overthrow of capitalism and without class struggle. It's as simple as that. Um, Greg, your paper does read, though, a bit like um, uh, uh, ideological uh, firing squad as you shoot each one of these uh, individual theories down. But I think it has to be confronted in that way. It's the point that Ursula's made. There's been a bit of, um, since the pandemic, certainly, there's been some who've been absolute optimists that this will demonstrate that actually the neoliberalism can't cope, nor can the market with crises like these and therefore we need public ownership and planning, et cetera, and the role of, of mutual aid, as well as elements of the state as well under democratic form. And there's been others who see as pessimistically the division of the class, the point that Ursula made, those who are um, usually uh, relatively well paid working from home, and those that are on the, well, it's been said on delivery, the people who are delivering the goods and actually exploited and forced into work, often in unsafe conditions. I agree with Ursa. Actually, the intensity of the work of those people who've been forced into working at home and the intensification of their work by the use of um, um, different media forms as well, as well as the exploitation of those who are um, still in the traditional work form and the intensification of their work has brought together a commonality of interests that combine people together rather than divide them. So I think there are opportunities there, which actually enables us to develop an understanding of the form of capitalism that we're now in, that, that does then develop into a form of struggle. And the forms of struggle, I think, uh, to, be, uh, to be enhanced, can be enhanced by the use of the technology. It's exactly as Mazina said. Look at what's happened in the UK with regard to the IWGB and the organization of gig workers and the use of new technology, both to make sure that, that they're communicating effectively, but also in the development of strategies that, that they can then use. And it's the same in virtually every field now that people are waking up to the ability to organize effectively in that way. But also it's been able to to a certain extent as well, it's creative works by some trades. For example, the global, the global campaign against Amazon now, which has exposed the intensive exploitation of the Amazon workers, but also has linked them up to consumers and the consumer campaign that is exposing, again, um, the, the exploitation of the individual products within individual supply chains. It then, it then uh, so the point I'm making is, we are now understanding in this age of formation of capitalism that class struggle actually does go on and is the basis upon which change can be brought about. But that doesn't mean that in some ways we aren't therefore looking at how we develop policies which will prefigure the society that we want to create. And the point that we were trying to make around the report that's been referred to that we did under the Labour Party when Jeremy and I were in the leadership positions about alternative forms of ownership was exactly that. But we did look at 
um, how we could use alternative forms of ownership to decommodify society. So it was, the food strategy was leading towards decommodification of food, but we were doing it on the basis of universal basic services linked to universal basic rights. So the right to food, the right to transport, and yes, the right to connectivity. That's what came by the idea around public ownership of um, the, the broadband system developed by public investment. But again, the where we were going to then was then what are the democratic forms that we want for those, that range of public ownership that we were brought, bring, bringing about. And again, uh, part of the work that I think we we most probably would have completed more effectively if in government is making sure that we were experimenting with different forms of ownership and democratic control that would engage people themselves. In some ways, the work that Hillary was doing through popular planning when we were at the GLC in the 1980s. I think what the book does and all the different articles do is actually do recognise that we could be in a situation where we can we can engender a paradigm change on quite a scale in this coming period as a result of the form the understanding of the formation of capital that we're now in the understanding of the struggles and class struggles that we are now going to be engaged in or are engaged in all the multitude of forms that there are out there but also in the alternatives that they are that we're promoting and one of the projects I've been involved in, and Hillary has as well, has been around what we've been calling it Claim the Future. And it has been a discussion about how we can bring about that paradigm change. And if you look at the running theme throughout this year's Socialist Register, it brings about really some of the basic principles of that, that paradigm change, um, which is uh, very similar to what happened after the Second World War with the uh, Attlee Labour government, which was setting out some basic I said basic principles upon which you build that paradigm change. One uh, is an economy which is based upon universal basic services. Um, again, so the right of access to employment, education, decent home, treatment and care when ill or elderly or disabled, and an income that can secure a good quality of life. The second element of that um, basic principle was an economy of true value where People assess uh, their value is not assessed by the market, but by the social contribution that they make. The third element of that is the point that was made earlier in the discussions, which is based on community and understanding of people living together, a reassertion of that there is such a thing as community. But then finally, the issue is around every decision that is made has to be based upon the climate threat that we face, and therefore uh, at its center must be sustainability. So my view at the moment is that we're moving to awards as a result of the pandemic to, to a certain extent. Uh, a questioning of, I don't think neoliberalism has been defeated or its hegemony has been defeated, but certainly the question of neoliberalism in a way which has opened up new opportunities to, to challenge it. But therefore that opens up the opportunities of offering the principles of different paradigm and therefore translating that into individual policies that can demonstrate that and prefigure the society that we want to create. That's what the Socialist Register has done in terms of challenging the way in which the new digital age that we're in can be used to that effect. The shift of the paradigm, the concrete understanding of the world we're in, and at the same time, practical examples of how we can move forward, both in the delivery of some of those basic goods, but also, as Mao has said, in the communication of them creatively so that we can convince and develop a cultural hegemony there as well. I think the bell has sounded for me, Hillary. Okay, thanks. Yeah. For me. Thanks. Yeah, clearly the bell isn't isn't loud enough, but but sensitive people are kind of registering it. So anyway, thanks so much, John. And I think your idea of a dis discussion about each chapter would be a one good way of taking this debate further. You know, I'm sure that um, Tribune and Socialist Register would collaborate and maybe your the framework of reclaim or claim the future that sort of idea of um a paradigm change stimulated by the um the covid crisis in the way that the paradigm change of of 45 was stimulated by the war could be a good sort of framework for then discussing each essay and reaching out i mean the participation in this is pretty good 
nearly 200 people and, and very international, which again is a tradition of, um, of socialist registers. So we've got everybody's email and plus the email of the other 300 people who registered. So we can start publishing the each essay, maybe with some of the feedback from this discussion. Uh, and then and then generate then have an event like this. I think Leo wants to come in. Um, um, uh, can we un, un um... Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Hillary? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, I I just want to say I'm watching this from my hospital room, and I won't put on the video. Um, uh, that would be too depressing. But this has been uh, the most rem the most remarkable tonic for me. Uh, much more useful than this cocktail of drugs I've been put on. Uh, and I want to thank you all for making it run so smoothly and brilliantly. I'm very, very proud of it. I just wanted to add that uh, in addition to the idea that each of the essays be a uh, afternoon or evening of discussion, then the Marxist Educational Project in New York is, did that last year, we'll do it this year, that we're having two other launches, as we always do. We always begin with one in London, uh, mostly with UK and, and European contributors. And then we have one in Toronto, usually in late January, and we'll put that on online. And we have a cornucopia of Canadian authors this year. Uh, Brian Palmer, uh, uh, Joan Sangster, uh, the essay by Tanner Murleys that has already been referred to on socialist and social media, uh, one on alternate socialist platforms by Derek Renishin, and of course, Greg's essay uh, that John referred to, which is so important. But then we'll also have a launch and as we usually do. Pat New, Pat New uh, Armstrong's on the hospital. And, and Pat New Armstrong's, of course, very important essay on uh, care for the elderly um, in relation to this pandemic. Um, uh, and then we'll also have one in New York, as we usually do, or focused in the States, where there's a general essay on decommodification uh, <clears throat> um, by, by Christoph Herman, uh, the essay <clears throat> by Robin Hinnell on planning versus markets. Uh, but we also have contributions from Larry Lohman, who is now uh, in Colombia, a very important essay on AI as an interpretation machine and another on the decommodification of clothing uh, by Gerano Bressan, uh, who's in uh, Argentina. And, and uh, it's not even impossible that we can bring in a brilliant essay from India uh, on the health system, building on Norman Bethune's scientific writings and applying that to the new technology uh, in, in the medical industries today. So that's what will be coming on early in the new year in addition to this brilliant UK launch, for which I'm really, really grateful. And especially to you, Hillary, uh, for hosting this so well, and to James Schneider uh, for putting it together uh, so technically, uh, immaculately. Thank you all very, very much. Great, and thank you, Leo. And, and I must say, Leo has been very involved in this launch. So Greg and I have had constant emails and Skypes and so on, and he, he's actually, He's very modest about how he looks. He's got a fantastic psychedelic T-shirt that the hospital have given him. Anyway, um, so uh, actually it's now 5.31 and we should have ended. So I think we've got to be punctual. We've got some very good other questions, but since we're carrying on this discussion, we can send those in the email to everybody. And also they can influence the debate that we have through Tribune and and Red Pepper on these different articles. So I think without more ado, if James can put in the link to the rally, and then Greg, before people disappear, Greg, just sort of wind up. I, I, I'm not sure I have anything uh, to add to, to Leo's, but to thank uh, uh, Red Pepper, uh, you, Hillary, uh, James and Tribune for kind of hosting us. Uh, it's, uh, I think, what I, Leo and I are particularly proud of is, is the way that we've managed to weave the pandemic and the struggles over pandemic politics through this volume that began on digital technology. Uh, but it was also, I think, the combination that we managed to deal with the, with the concentration of power and resources so much in digital capitalism uh, alongside the way that all the authors and contributors did 
integrated kind of new ways of living and thinking about alternatives that uh, John so eloquently picked up on. So thank you very much for everybody participating. The contributors did a great job. Hillary was such a magnificent chair and wasn't too mean to anybody. <laughs> so thank you all for that. Okay, and finally, just one or two little things. We must thank Tony Zibrugo, who's who's sort of sitting in the shadows in a very dark blue kind of scene, uh, who's the publisher of, of, of Socialist Register, Merlin Press. And Merlin Press is a really stalwart uh, socialist publisher that has been going, I don't know since when, but since as long as I've been politically alive. Uh, and um, so thank you, Tony, for sticking with um, the left. Uh, sticking with Socialist Register in particular. And also I wanted to mention, I think I forgot in my introduction, that Mo Molina, he's not only a writer, but he is a film producer himself and has produced a film I haven't yet seen, but I really, it's on my, my lockdown list called Steel Lives about Sheffield. Um, so to thank everybody else for coming and um, now let's move on to the rally, those that want and all support and solidarity with, I was going to say John, but I think everybody, whereas... As, as, as he and Jeremy have always said, we're in this together. So it's about mutual solidarity and building, building our strength, you know, outside the Labour Party as well as inside. So thank you. I, I'd like to clap. <laughs>